Continuing a roll call vote. That's Chairman Henry Waxman on your screen. Live coverage on C-SPAN 3. Those other people are not. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I think so. Mr. Stearns. <clears throat> Mr. Stearns votes aye. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Is the clerk prepared to announce the vote? Yes, for two seconds. Oh, there are some members coming. still coming. Certainly, we'll wait. We're prepared, Dan. Clerk will announce the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the ayes were 25 and the nays were 31. 25 but, eyes, 31 no's. I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Hold on. I apologize. That vote, the eyes were 22, the nays were 34. <laughs> 22 eyes, 34 no's. The amendment's not agreed to. Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I recognize anybody, I just want uh, to inform people that we have a number of of, of tally, talliers, tellers, and uh, there's a check and a double check to be sure that all the votes are uh, correct. And uh, that's, that's the least we can expect. We, when members here vote, every vote should be counted and all the votes should be counted correctly. Um, uh, uh, an amendment Mr. Chairman. Would now oh, I do have an amendment at the desk. If I may be recognized. Pardon? Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. If I may be recognized. Uh, let me go to the Democratic side. Oh, okay. Gentlemen's recognized. Mr. Radonovich, you have an amendment to offer to the bill? I, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, number 595A at the desk. It's the 100 percent electricity price increase okay. amendment. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and the gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, recently in California, the California Air Resources Air Board uh, released a report that talked about the, uh, uh, the California global warming bill that would actually benefit California's economy. But Dorothy Rothrick, who is a spokeswoman for the California Manufacturers and Technology Association, says this analysis is long on wishful thinking but short on economic reality. Even though it was supported by the Sierra Club and the NRDC, she went on to state that there is no evaluation of the real-time costs that California businesses and consumers will pay up front, she says. Governments can get away with deficit spending, but in the real world, families and businesses have to pay bills every month or there are se severe consequences says Shelley, uh, Shelley Sullivan, who is the executive director of AB32 implementation, uh, implementation Group. We are looking at billions in increased electricity, natural gas, gasoline and fuel prices, billions in new carbon fees and water fees, higher building costs, rents and mortgages, and the California Air Resources uh, Air Board assumes that we can afford to pay for all this and wait for savings 12 years from now. Ms. Sullivan, Ms. Sullivan and Ms. Rothrick worry that increased regulation and costs will result in business flight to other states or countries where less stringent laws would ensure an overall increase in pollution. Ironically, a California 
business could relocate to India or China where the mix of energy consumption includes coal, which would pollute the atmosphere worse than if it stayed in California, says Rothrig. The state's industries are among the cleanest in the world because of strict regulations, she says. Higher taxes, fuel and labor costs already mean that doing business in California costs more than anywhere in the United States. And it's with that in mind that, that I submit this legislation that states that uh, uh, under the reporting of the Secretary of Labor, if there's a, excuse me, if there's a, under the reporting of the Secretary of the Energy, if there's a 100 percent increase above 2009 electric rates adjusted for inflation, that the provisions of Title III of this Act will cease to be effective. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have to say, and I ask for a recorded vote on this amendment. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Oh, uh, Mr. If I may reclaim just a couple of minutes. Yes. Uh, I, I will, do want to state that that um, Edison Electric in Southern California just today increased their rates from 10, from anywhere between 10 to 15 percent on residential users. So this is the effect that Californians are having on their state global warming bill. And this type of rate increases on residential users will be experienced nationwide if uh, this type of legislation is adopted. And with that, I yield back and thank the chair and ask for a recorded vote. What, Mr. Chairman? What, uh, gentlemen, you yield to you. I, I Mr. Bradanovich, you could yield uh, back. I, Mr. Mr. Martin. Yield to Mr. I want to make a point of order that a quorum is not present. Yeah. Well, the gentleman is correct. Uh, ask for a call of the committee. Uh, well, uh, we could do that. But why don't we continue to debate this? You want everybody here for the debate. Oh, okay. I thought. Sure. No, no, no. I'm not ready. To, you know, you can de we'll debate. I don't mind. Sure. Wait till okay. Fine. Yeah. Uh, we uh, gentlemen, just have a draws, show of hands on this amendment. I think. Well, we're not ready uh, yet because we haven't debated it. We've only heard one side. You're all anxious to vote. <laughs> just, just to show of hands. We can, we can avoid the roll call. Okay. Well, that would be helpful, but but let's uh, let's uh, uh, if gentleman's time is it is uh, is almost over, but he's yielded it back. So the chair will recognize himself, and uh, with all uh, due respect, I, I I do have to oppose this amendment. This amendment, uh, it, like so many of the other amendments we've had during this markup, provides that if certain event occurs, the provisions of Title III will cease to be effective. And I, I don't think that makes sense. That, you know, that you're trying to put out all sorts of awful situations that would require us to act and uh, act immediately. But whether the action should be that the whole act, uh, Title III of, the, of this proposed bill, uh, this proposed law, should be ineffective is a serious question and I think an inappropriate response. I don't want an automatic off-ramp which dissolves the legislation. There will be a lot of consequences to that, and we may well need to address the specific problem uh, that is causing, uh, in this case, on this amendment, uh, 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 as much as 100 uh, percent increase over uh, 2009 electric rates adjusted for inflation. So uh, I. Uh, with all due respect, uh, think this is not a. I know it's a message amendment. I know it's for many of you to say those who support this proposed law uh, weren't even willing to look at the fact that there could be a tremendous increase in rates. Well, we do care about the increases in rates, and we would want to respond to the increase in rates, but the only response that you uh, are suggesting we take is the one that you want to ordain now, and that's to stop the whole law from taking effect and staying in effect. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a meat axe approach. It doesn't deal with the problem, whatever the problem is going to be. We don't anticipate rates to be increasing as a result of the, uh, of the way the market has been structured and as a result of the space amendment that is going to protect the ratepayers by making sure that the allocations are used to protect those ratepayers from any increase in their utility costs. I also want to say in response to the, uh, my friend from California, if there are increases in California's rates, I, I, I don't want it to be stated as a fact that it's due to California's en energy law. I remember so well 
when California had the spike in our electricity rates, and everybody and, I, and we met with Vice President Cheney, and we said California is on the ropes because our our wholesale rates were so high. You've got to help us, and he said, "Well, that's due be to your environmental laws. You shouldn't have all those environmental protection laws in California." Well, you know, it turned out that we told him what we told him was right, that we were being gouged by the wholesalers, the Enron company particularly. And the reason we know this was true is when we found out that the tapes from Enron, uh, conversations of executives, that they would withhold wholesale power just to drive up the rates. They even chuckled over the fact that a lot of elderly and low-income people were going to have to pay a lot more for their electricity but they were going to make a lot more profit as a result of it. So I wouldn't jump to conclusions as we sometimes hear from people who say California's problems are due to environmental laws and I think the suggestion is if there are increases in California it's due to our environmental energy laws. I, 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 will, I won't accept that as a, as a fact that could just be stated because I'm, I don't believe that to be true and I would want to see a lot more evidence than just a statement of fact. Uh, this amendment is now before us. Mr. Chairman, would you yield on that moment? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, you know, the chair mentioned that these are nothing but uh, message amendments. I'm looking here at my BlackBerry, and since we started this markup, I've received five uh, attack messages from the Republican National and NRCC Communications, the latest one being last night at 10.29 last night, saying that we're against jobs, saying we're against... Uh, America saying we're for high prices of so you're absolutely right this is just another message amendment and those of us on the committee who may be in like in my case a Republican leaning seat but I'm a Democrat we will, we can be assured there'll be another press release so I've had five now in the first two days and I'm sure when we're done with this markup by the time we're done probably be at least three more so uh, these are just message amendments they're not sincere they're they're not really towards uh, promoting good legislation or correcting or identifying a problem. It's just for message. So I hope we would stay united and vote no, because I don't want to be the only one getting these emails. Thanks. Now you're back. <laughs> um, Mr. Barton, you ask. You I want to recognition. speak in support of it. Um, well, first of all, truth in advertising. Some of these do have a message. There's no question about that. Uh, it's not necessarily attack on our friends on the majority side as much as is it an effort to send a message to the American people that we want to protect them from what we think are the potential uh, ravages of this bill. Um, we have offered a, uh, uh, a price protection amendment at 10 percent. We've offered a price protection amendment at 20 percent. And now we're offering it at 100 percent. At some point in time, um, there should be some recognition from the proponents of this legislation that if prices do go too high, uh, Title III, this particular amendment refers to Title III, uh, which is the, uh, the cap and trade mechanism, uh, shall, shall uh, uh, cease to exist. Now, uh, there are sections in the bill that we've not addressed yet where there are massive unemployment compensation schemes uh, in place. Uh, so there is some recognition uh, in parts of this bill that, that there are going to be some, some negative economic consequences. We're just trying to put a price cap on, uh, on the electricity increase. And, and again, there's an acknowledgement of that on the majority side. We did accept an amendment from Mr. Space of Ohio uh, that uh, uh, has some effect on that, which is an improvement in the bill. I also want to comment very briefly on the um, comments about the California electric uh, uh, market from several years ago. California uh, devised its own electricity market within the state of California uh, in which they outlawed long-term contracts uh, between uh, distribution companies uh, and power suppliers. They created a system where everybody who provided power to electricity users in California had to buy that power on the spot market every day. They then, 
because of various restrictions that the state put in place on new power construction, uh, hadn't built a new power plant in California in between five and ten years. And when the California population and economy grew, uh, they created a situation where you had a limited amount of power that had to be auctioned off every day on the spot market. Uh, and the Enrons of the world, uh, seeing that uh, situation, uh, did take advantage of it. Chairman's correct about that. But uh, the California legislature itself created the environment in which they didn't allow long-term contracts, they didn't allow power, uh, large power consumers to enter into direct contracts with power suppliers outside of the state, and they forced everybody to buy their power on the spot market. And to compound it, they added a provision that everybody who bought power on the spot market had to pay the market clearing price that the last person to put power into the market. Will the gentleman yield? I, 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 I agree with the, what the gentleman is saying, but the true problem with the crisis in California was failure of the then Governor Gray Davis to act to force the utilities into long-term contracts immediately, which would have ended the crisis then and there. And it was that he could have done that, but it was that failure of leadership that extenuated the Just problem in reclaim California. Reclaim my time. So. We finally, the Bush administration and the FERC chairman then was a gentleman named Pat Wood from Houston, Texas, put price caps on the California market. The FERC then authorized a series of investigations that ended up uh, in, the, in some of the market manipulators paying massive refunds and going to jail. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're going to proceed to a vote, but the uh, Chair wants to just make a very brief statement. California had a, a very dysfunctional market based on a law that was promoted by Ken Lay and Enron and some of the other big companies, and then they took advantage of it. And my only point in raising that was not to get into the emotional debate about who did what in California, but Vice President Cheney said to me personally, the problem in California is you have all those environmental laws. That's why California is paying such high rates for electricity. And he refused to acknowledge what we knew later to be the case, that Enron was taking advantage of this uh, dysfunctional market that uh, was created. But on the amendment that's pending, uh, I, 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 I think we just have to uh, disagree. There is no point where we'll say the law ought to be put out of effect because there are a lot of consequences when that happens. There are people who will be relying on the law and just to suddenly pull the rug out from everybody and say the law is no longer effective is not a solution to a problem that we don't anticipate, do not anticipate to exist. And if it does exist, it may not be the appropriate response. So we have a disagreement over this issue. We've had a number of amendments on it. And uh, I, I would urge uh, defeat of the amendment. How, how, do, uh, how do you wish to proceed? Do you want a show of hands? Do you want a uh, roll call vote? OK, let's roll, go to roll a roll call, call vote. vote. Mr. Chair. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Markey. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak votes no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Get. Mr. Get, no. Mrs. Caps. Mr. Doyle. Mr. 
Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon votes no. Ms. Joukowsky. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner votes no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen votes no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton votes no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley votes no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield votes aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt votes aye. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Bono Mack votes aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mr. Sutton. I mean, excuse me, Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Burgess. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn votes aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise votes aye. Mr. The clerk Shattuck, will no. call those members who have not yet responded to the roll. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone, no. Mrs. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel, no. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky, no. Mr. Rush. <clears throat> Mr. Rush, no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps votes no. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry votes aye. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, no. Mr. 
Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Clerk will tally the vote. Uh, Mr. Markey, um, you want to vote on this? Not recorded, Mr. Chairman. Oh, you are Markey? recorded. Mr. Markey votes now. Mr. Burgess, are you recorded? Oh, let's see. Not recorded. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Okay. <laughs> Is the clerk ready to report the vote? Yes, sir. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there were 19 ayes <clears throat> and 30 noes. 19 ayes, 30 noes, the amendment's not agreed to. Uh, Chair, would like to recognize Mr. Uh, first of all, I want to recognize Ms. Castor for a unanimous consent request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman and my colleagues, uh, an extraordinary statement of principles on energy and climate legislation has been issued this morning by 30 uh, governors across the political spectrum, 23 Democrats, 7 Republicans, including my own governor, uh, Charlie Crist of Florida. It's a broad statement of responsible, pragmatic, and far-sighted leadership on one of the most important issues of our time. So I'm pleased to share this statement with the committee and ask unanimous consent that it be distributed now. Uh, three important points from this bipartisan statement by the governors. First, that we urgently need a comprehensive strategy on energy. Second, that we invest in using energy more efficiently and producing uh, more clean energy here at home. And third, that we set a cap on greenhouse gases to reduce emissions to levels guided by science to avoid dangerous uh, global warming. The governor's statement also says that it is in the states where the green economy will be built and the states and the governor's pledge to work with us here in Congress to develop a partnership to build an energy efficient and energy independent and energy secure economy. M Mr. Chairman, I believe this statement of principles by these 30 governors with significant bipartisan support is fully aligned with the principles and policies and programs in this historic legislation. I hope later today we will respond to our governors by voting to report this important bill from the committee. Thank the gentlelady. Mr. Chairman. I would now recognize Mr. McNerney. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Yes. May I just ask the gentlelady from Florida one question? Yes, gentlemen, recognize. Uh, the gentlelady from Florida, uh, I, would, I would like to ask if, if those 30 governors endorse this specific legislation. I think they're, they are endorsing a strategy that is fully consistent with the uh, bill we've considered here over the past few months and will vote out today. But they did not endorse this bill. I think their action is clear when it comes on the day that we are going to vote out uh, the legislation. I think the message is crystal clear. The chair recognizes Mr. McNerney. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to engage in a colloquy with you. Certainly. Gentlemen is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The American Clean Energy and Security Act is groundbreaking legislation that will com combat climate change and create countless clean energy jobs. I am proud to support this bill, but I would like also to take this opportunity to discuss an important issue that I hope we are able to address in, as this legislation moves toward consideration by the House. The bill issues allowances to power producers and distribution companies to protect, to protect customers and provide a smooth transition to the clean energy economy. The bill appropriately distributes allowances to companies producing electricity under long-term contracts that do not allow them to recover costs associated with carbon regulation. A similar arrangement was made under the Clean Air Act's acid rain program. At this time, however, the bill does not provide allowances to cover these same facilities steam sales which are made under similar long-term contracts. I am concerned that this omission may inadvertently harm consumers and companies, including some 
in California that have acted early and decisively to combat climate change. I would ask that we continue to work together to address this issue. I also believe that my colleague, Mr. Green from Texas, would like to offer comments on this subject, and I yield to him. I'd like to thank my good friend, uh, Congressman McNerney, for raising this important issue. Mr. Chairman, as Ms. McNerney points out, your bill wisely contains a provision to hold harmless generators with long-term contracts to provide power who can't recover their costs because their contracts did not anticipate carbon regulation. However, the bill as currently drafted would exclude an important group of cogeneration facilities, including some in Texas, which from receiving this temporary relief because the bill only covers power contracts with electric energy, not thermal energy in the form of steam. And now, Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding that only a relatively small portion of allowances have been set aside for these generators with long-term power contracts. It's also my understanding that if we were to make clear that those who are in the exact same circumstance with regard to thermal contracts can apply to receive allowances from this small pool, it would not affect the total or the percentage of allowances currently made available to LDCs or merchant coal under the bill. Mr. Chairman, I ask that we work together to resolve this problem prior to floor consideration by clarifying that cogeneration facilities that have long-term contracts for useful thermal energy would also be eligible to receive allowances under the long-term contract provisions. And I thank you for, um, and I yield back my time, or back to Ms. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, would you yield to me? Yes, I, I want, yield I'll, to the chairman. I want to thank uh, you and Mr. Green for your attention to this issue. Um, I, you have our agreement to work with you on this issue as we move this bill forward for consideration by the House. We will do so in close consultation with Mr. Boucher, given his expertise on electricity, on expertise on electricity issues. But I want to thank both of you for bringing this issue to our attention. Does the gentleman from California yield back his time? Yes, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, chair, recognize the gentleman from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And much to my, a lot of my colleagues' chagrin, this might be the last time I get to speak on this bill. Um, Are I you know asking you're disappointed. Consent? Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Let, wait, me, wait, wait, wait. let me just start by saying. Um, wait, 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 wait. You asked to speak, and they said this will be the last time you'll speak, and then the gentlelady reserved yeah, a point, point of order. order. Against my speech. Against no amendment. Speaking. Do you have an amendment? I have an amendment. Shimk is 020. Without objection, that amendment will be considered. I was trying to trap her. Yeah. That amendment will be considered as read. A point of order will be reserved uh, by the gentlelady from Cal uh, Colorado. And I recognize the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. Uh, we've learned a lot in this markup. Uh, my colleague, Mr. Booyer, raised the issue about the least affected by this bill are actually some of the major authors of this bill. In fact, the Evansville Courier states that since Indiana has 94 percent coal production, they will be harmed. Illinois, 47.6, they will be harmed. Kentucky, 93 percent, they will be harmed. California and the home state of Chairman, 1 percent, no harm. Massachusetts, home state of Chairman Markey, 25 percent, no harm. And it's curious that the districts that aren't harmed are some of the wealthiest districts in the country. Medium income of mine is 48,000 based upon the census report, uh, American Community Survey 2007. Uh, Mr. Whitfield's is 36,000 a year. Uh, Mr. Boyer used 37,000 in his calculations last night. Chairman Waxman, 79,000. Chairman Markey, $68,000 a year. The wealthier districts pay less. What a shock. The poor districts pay more. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. Many of these poor districts have coal mines. So we're now in a double jeopardy situation for poor rural America. And I want to ensure that more coal mines do not close, especially in response to the FERC chairman's announcement that there will be no more baseload energy created by coal or nuclear power. 
My amendment is very simple. If because of this act, two coal mines close, this sec title three would be null and void. Now, we've heard talks about the 90 amendments. My, my staff will put this up. This, these are not, this is not a paid political advertisement. These are real coal miners who lost their jobs in the 1990 amendments of the Clean Air Act. And I would say to those authors of this am amendment that this, the 90 amendments at least were for toxic emittance. Carbon dioxide is not a toxic emittance. So who paid the price? The people who paid the price were Midwestern states. This mine, one mine, 1,200 jobs closed. And I was at that rally to watch politicians come and say, we're going to save your jobs. And they were the very same politicians who voted for the bill. I swore on that day I would never vote for a bill and then go to these guys and say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to fight to keep your jobs. Now. My colleagues on the Energy and Air Quality Subcommittee have heard this speech before. The rest of the full committee has not. So that's why I bring it up one last time. You know how many coal miners lost their job in the last Clean Air Act amendments? You all know, I've said it 1,500 times. 14,000. The state of Ohio, you know how many coal miners lost their jobs? And that was testimony in this committee. 35 thousand jobs. 35,000 jobs. This isn't going to hurt jobs. You got a simple solution. You got a simple off ramp. Two coal mines close an off ramp. When we were talking about this bill in the previous Congress with the previous chairman, we talked about industry wide with off ramps. But we had a change at the helm. Guess what? No off ramps. And that's what we've been doing for the past three days is talking about off ramps to make sure that if electricity prices go high, we have an off ramp. This amendment says if these guys get screwed in this bill, we're going to have an off ramp to protect jobs. I don't trust you. I don't trust this bill. This bill will cost jobs. And this is a great insurance policy if you really, really, really believe that your bill will not cost jobs. And with that, I will return the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my reservation. Gentlemen's time has expired. The uh, reservation of a point of order has been withdrawn. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Uh, after which we will respond to the vote and come back and vote. So if members uh, 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 want to uh, leave at some point, they, c they can feel free to leave and come, and they will still be able to vote when they return. I, I just want to point out that coal production in the United States has increased by 15 percent since 1991. Well, how could that be? And then there have been a loss of jobs in Illinois and the East Coast coal areas. Part of the reason for it is that in 1990, when the Clean Air Act was adopted, the utilities were given the requirement to reduce the sulfur emissions and some of the other pollutants. They could have done that, uh, particularly the sulfur emissions, in one of two ways. They could have put scrubbers on, uh, especially when high sulfur coal was being burned. Or they could have used low sulfur western coal. Well, the utilities had the choice, and they chose the least costly alternative. They moved much more in the direction of taking low sulfur western coal than in paying for the scrubbers. Now, a little history lesson. When we were trying to get legislation through in this committee to deal with acid rain, some of us who wanted to deal with that problem and get the pollution reductions to stop the acid rain offered a proposal that would have provided uh, a subsidy to pay for the scrubbers. 
And the response to that, I thought, was generous offer was, there's no problem such as acid rain and we're not going to deal with it. Several years later, in 1990, the Congress passed for a law under the Clean Air Act calling for those reductions without any subsidy to help pay for the scrubbers. And the utilities did what was in their economic interests, and jobs had been lost. And I'm sorry that jobs have been lost, but that was sometimes the result of actions or inactions. There are consequences. Well, we now have a proposal before us that uh, uh, this amendment uh, uh, to, um, uh, to stop the implementation, implementation of the provisions of Title III if there are losses of coal jobs. This bill, I think, will give the power industry the certainty and support they need to build new coal-fired power plants, ensuring the continued use of coal in this country. So if you care about the coal industry, realize that the utilities are waiting to know what the rules are going to be. And if the rules are that they uh, will be able to build new power plants and use coal in the future, it will be a better future for coal. If this law does not pass, I don't think it's going to be a clear picture of what the will, situation will be for coal in this country. We've taken strong steps to protect coal mining jobs by providing the support to build a whole new generation of coal-fired power plants with very low emissions of carbon dioxide. We provide regulatory certainty in this law that we're proposing, and this bill would lose one of the key barriers to building these power plants. The bill dedicates 2 percent of the allowances in the first few years and 5 percent thereafter to cover the full costs of installing carbon capture and sequestration technology and running it for the first 10 years of operation. So the bill gives coal a path forward. If the gentleman from Illinois who is offering the amendment uh, wants to defeat the bill, I suggest to him that he, is, he, he would be defeating the opportunity for the use of coal in the future. Now, his specific amendment uh, it says that if, uh, if, the, uh, if by virtue of the provisions of this law that uh, if two or more coal mines close, then all the provisions of Title III will be out the window. Well, I hope they don't have to close, but that's going to be a business decision. But if the law, if this bill, overall bill, becomes law, the business decisions that will be made will to be to build new power plants burning coal. Now, that ought to be good no news for those from the coal areas and for the uh, environment and for the uh, in, uh, utilities that want to use coal in the future. So I would urge the rejection of the Shimkus Amendment and uh, the adoption of the overall bill that's before us. My time has now expired. Uh, the chair would like to declare a recess unless uh, we want further debate. I Mr. Could, Barton? I could have two minutes. Gentlemen. Even one minute. I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, to make further comments before we Very briefly, recess. Mr. Chairman. I support the, um, uh, the Shimkus Amendment. I, I just want to read from a news article in the Charleston Gazette, either today or yesterday, talking about the bill and complimenting Congressman Boucher on his efforts to, uh, to uh, improve the bill. Um, the UMW representative talks about some bonus uh, amendment, some bonus allowances uh, that Mr. Boucher has negotiated that should be worth between 180 should be worth around $181 billion between now and 2050. Then the President of the United Mine Workers, Mr. Roberts, said in a statement, the legislation contains many pro-coal items that his union supports, but that he still has some concerns, quote, about the bill. Phil Smith, a union spokesman, said that the UMW supports what Boucher has done and what he says will be a continuing effort to reduce the overall near-term emissions reduction even further to at least 14 percent. On Wednesday, the National Mining Association issued a statement repeating its prior opposition to earlier versions of the Waxman-Markey bill. 
The National Mining Association recognizes changes to the original draft of the legislation are intended to reduce harmful economic consequences of the legislation. These changes, however, are not sufficient to produce a balanced and responsible policy for addressing climate change concerns, said Mining Association President Hal Quinn. And, quote, the result will be a devastating loss of high-paying mining jobs, higher energy costs for businesses, and the exporting of American businesses and jobs to countries that do not require similar greenhouse gas emission reductions, end quote. So we recognize that efforts are being made to protect the mining industry and the coal industry, but if this legislation becomes law, Mr. Chairman, they're going, according to the National Mining Association, the devastating loss of mining jobs, and I don't see how anybody in this country will build a coal plant when they're, when, with that, with okay. the carbon capture and sequestration technology not mature, a coal plant's going to emit uh, significantly more CO2 emissions uh, than any other form of baseload generation. They're just, they're not going to do it. The so, gentleman's time has expired. We are being summoned to the House floor to respond to two votes. I know other members may wish to speak on this particular amendment, so I won't close the debate. And we will come back as soon as we can after the second vote. So, Chairman Henry Waxman recessing the House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee. This markup session continuing now for a fourth day, working on legislation that would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Members taking a break now to vote on the House floor. A vote right now underway on a conference agreement on weapons acquisition in the U.S. House. Still to come in the House today, Federal Aviation Administration reauthorization. That's live on C-SPAN, House coverage. Uh, by the way, no legislative business uh, is scheduled for the House tomorrow. Today should wrap up work in the U.S. House before the week-long Memorial Day holiday break. Today in the Senate, additional war spending for Iraq and Afghanistan. Senators continue work on that measure with uh, more amendments and a possible final passage vote today. The Senate is live on our companion network, C-SPAN 2. Well, while we wait for the uh, House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee to return to this markup session, we'll show you a discussion on the 2010 budget for the Transportation Security Administration. It's from this morning's Washington Journal. Now, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, Democrat from Texas, eighth term now in the 18th district, and uh, TSA, the Transportation Security Administration, is the topic uh, here, the, the upcoming budget for TSA. Lay it out for us. How much is the budget? How does it compare? And what are the priorities?